Okay, so that's my last lecture. Uh, I'm not going to make a big review what we discussed previously, but you were yesterday because we're so, so, we're so close in time, there's no need for a, for a summary. So yesterday we, we, we started um, discussing the modifications suffered by a jet while propagating to the medium. We said that all the modifications related to, to the elastic scatterings between the constituents of the jet and the constituents of the medium, as you see illustrated in this cartoon here, so it says the jet is generated by this, uh, this parton, which is the parton, which is a leading particle, a quark, and it can radiate and can also suffer collisions. And yesterday we, we, are, we made a simple calculation of the medium effect in terms of transverse momentum broadening. And we also argued on that occasion that these uh, collisions trigger additional radiation. And that's the main effect in terms of the region in the sense that this is the mechanism which is responsible for the energy lost by the jet. And from, so today I will going to discuss for you in great detail medium induced radiation and the interplay between medium induced and vacuum like emissions as well. Hopefully I'll have the time. So the collisions provide acceleration and so they trigger additional radiation in the same way as the original hard scattering. Even if this parton was produced on shell by accident, it never happened, but even if it was produced on shell, the collision can give virtuality. Virtuality is acceleration, right? So, so there will be medium induced radiation independent of the, of the virtuality of the initial parton. Now, in general, the, this parton has virtuality, so it will radiate independently of the medium, and it also scatters, so there will be radiation independent of the virtuality. So we are applied two mechanisms for radiation, vacuum light, which is triggered by the original hard scattering, and medium induced, which is associated with scattering the medium. It is not clear that they can be distinguished because they can melt in a single complicated mechanism. If the parton was strictly on shell, we would have only medium induced, we can distinguish it. If it was in the vacuum, we have only vacuum like, but if they're together, who knows? But I'll apply the two mechanisms, understand them both and the interplay between them. And, uh, there is still already a clear physical criterion which allows us to distinguish, at least at a rough way, between the two types of radiation. We should look at, at the formation time. I remind you that it takes a time of TF, which is omega over the k perp squared, to emit a gluon, which has an energy omega and transverse momentum k perp. And this is universal. This comes from the uncertainty principle. Now, in the vacuum, omega and k perp are independent kinematical variables. They're just what is given by, by the emission vertex, according to the brain and probability distribution, of course. In particular, if the, the gluon is emitted at very small angles, so in the collinear limit, theta goes to zero, or k perp goes to zero, then the formation, uh, the formation time is very large. So the most likely radiation in, 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 a, in a vacuum, which is the collinear radiation, is also the, the one which is delayed in, in practice. But that's only in the vacuum, because in the medium, collisions introduce a low limit on k per. Because during the splitting, so during the formation time, this whole radiating system is scattering of the medium. So if it takes a time CF to, to, to produce the gluon, then after that time, this radiating system would have at least a transverse momentum squared of the Q hat TF. It cannot avoid that, because the emission is, is produced inside the medium. So, this gluon, which is produced now, say with energy fraction x and transverse momentum k perp, this transverse momentum k perp can be still an independent variable from omega, but cannot be lower than the value it would acquire during the formation time. So having a, a, a lower limit on k perp means an upper limit on the formation time. And then we can distinguish between the two types of emission according at least to this criterion. We can speak about vacuum-like emissions. If the transverse momentum k perp squared of the produced gluon, it's much larger than you had TF. So essentially the, 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 vacuum, the momentum comes from the vertex and not from the medium rescattering. In that case, the medium rescattering is less important and the formation time, uh, because k perp is much bigger than the, the, this limit set by, by, the formation, by, by the medium, the formation time is much smaller than this upper limit. This upper limit comes by, by taking the gener generic formula for the formation time and by inserting uh, for k perp its lower limit, which is q hat tf. Then we have a simple equation for tf as function of omega. So this upper limit, uh, it's a function of omega alone. This upper limit would be the formation time for, for medium induced emissions. So in case k perp squared is equal to exactly q hat tf, which means that essentially the whole momentum of the produced particle comes from the scattering during the formation time, in that case, the formation time has uh, uh, reaches this maximal value, which is in, depending on, on the energy alone, because now k-perp is not an independent variable. k-perp is fixed by the collision in the plasma during the formation time. So 
we have either hard and prompt emission, prompt means the formation time much smaller than the in medium formation time, and hard meaning transient momenta much larger than the in medium um, broadening, or medium induced emission, which saturates those limits, which have the lowest possible transient momentum, and hence the largest possible formation time for a given energy. And this argument also shows that in the medium, there is no genuinely collinear radiation. One cannot go to the limit k perp goes to zero. Forget you know, about confinement, but just in the partonic level. Because k perp cannot be smaller than the limit given by the medium rescattering during the formation time, which is the limit coming from, from here. Just replace k perp squared. We had the tau formation with tau formation given by this formula. So there is no, the, the, the radiation is always relatively hard or no, non collinear. And that will be important in what follows. Okay. Um, so, we have two types of radiation, as I just mentioned. I will start by, by studying the medium induced emissions alone. If you want, you can imagine that the incoming leading parton has zero virtuality. Then it cannot radiate except by collision. So in that case, the only mechanism of collision is this one. It acquires virtuality through collisions, and, and it radiates. And then the formation time is given by this formula, and the transient moment to add the formation is given by this formula. And the question is, what is the pro probability for having such a process? And that's, that's been worked out in some pioneering papers back in the mid 90s uh, by two groups, essentially by Dr. Mueller, Pena, and Schiff, essentially working in Paris and Zaharov in Russia. And uh, with conclusion, we agree with each other. And by now, the theory is, is pretty well understood, but it was a tour de force at that time to understand this detailed. So, uh, first of all, me. And yes? K KF is just, sorry, it's just a notation for the limit, for the limit, so it's a definition for the minimal transverse momentum which is acquired by Gruen's energy omega during the formation time. So that's what it, it will acquire anyway by, by medium scattering. It can have a larger K-perp, in that case it is medium, it is vacuum-like, but it cannot be, back, be as low than that. And when his K-perp is of that order, then we are sure that it was medium induced because it has suffered a lot of scatterings and, okay. That will appear again in the, in the spectrum here. So, unlike, unlike the, the vacuum-like emissions, which, which have a formation time which is naturally measured from the hard process, the medium-induced emission have a formation time which is naturally measured from the scattering. And the scattering can occur anywhere, so the formation time can be measured anywhere, or if you want, from, from anywhere to, in other terms, the gluon can be emitted anywhere inside the medium. And because of that, it is appropriate to work not just with the spectrum, but with the emission rate, which is in the probability to emit a gluon with a given omega, a given k-perp, and per unit time. And this is quite intuitive to, to try the formula. Of course, it, it requires uh, but it's quite, quite intuitive. So there is a factor alpha s that has a color factor of the, of the emitter. It starts like the branch tongue. There is a factor one over omega for the standard branch tongue. But then it, it, it starts being different. The, the rate, so the, the probability to have one gluon per unit time, it's proportional to the inverse of the formation time inside the medium. Now I, I, I place F by medium here just to, to emphasize that I'm now I'm speaking about gluons produced by medium induced radiation. So their formation time, take this particular expression, which depends on omega alone. So this is what I appear here as, as the upper limit. Now this upper limit is, is realized because we're looking at medium induced emissions. So the inverse of the formation time specifies the rate for producing the gluon. And the transit momentum distribution is not any more singular as it was in from Bremsstrahlung, but now it, it has this, this momentum distribution given by, by mom, transit momentum broadening during formation time. So it is a Gaussian uh, with the K perp, uh, expectation value of K perp squared being given precisely by this KF I showed before here. So that's momentum acquired during the formation time. So that's the spectrum of the gluon at the time of the formation. It is emitted in this time with this energy, with this transit momentum, with this distribution of transit momentum. Now, if you look at this, uh, this expression, obviously there is no collinear singularity, there is no collinear log, but there is neither energy or soft log. 
because of the energy dependence. It's not only the one of omega from the branch trunk, but also one of the square root of omega coming from the formation time. So this spectrum is much more uh, singular as small omega than the branch trunk spectrum. It's not infinitely singular. So it's not uh, logarithmically singular. It's power-like singular. And because of that, there is no soft log. So this, this medium-induced spectrum, the BDMPSZ spectrum, has no collinear nor soft logarithmic enhancement. It's very different from the branch trunk spectrum in that respect. This has dramatic consequences. I'll show you later. Uh, this spectrum is only applying to medium-induced emissions, which means emissions which occur inside the medium, so that this formation time should remain more than L. And this introduces an upper limit of omega, because the formation time grows with the square root of omega. And this upper limit just equates that with L, to, turns out to be Q hat L squared divided by 2. And that's denoted traditionally omega C, omega cut, I think. I don't know what the C comes, I think cut. And that, this cut energy is the hardest energy scale associated with medium-induced radiation, because that's the maximum energy which can be emitted in this way. For this mechanism to apply, you need multiple soft scatterings. You see, multiple soft scatterings. So you need the formation time to be much larger than the mean free path in the plasma between two successive scatterings. And this condition introduces a lower limit on the energy, which happens to be that the energy should be of order t. So we see we are looking at energy for the emitted gluons, which are hard on the medium scale. If the medium has a temperature T, like 500 MeV, in fact, we are looking at energies which are much bigger than this temperature scale. And, and the typical value for omega C is like 50 GeV. So from half GeV to 50 GeV, there's a huge phase for that. And we're really looking at hard radiation. So we're doing medium, just, we're doing medium physics, but with hard radiation. That's why PQCD is so well in control. Not, it's not thermal physics. The, 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 the thermal properties only enter as a cutoff. OK, so now, what, 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 what is the angular distribution of the radiation? Uh, so this is a cartoon trying to show the emission of a gluon. Uh, the gluon is, uh, the uh, emission starts here. This is a formation time, the one I called here tau med. In this uh, drawing, it's tau, called tau formation, with all the drawing. During the formation time, the gluon acquires a transit momentum. This one we shown here. And because of that, it has some non trivial angle, the formation angle, which is a transit momentum divided by the energy. And that's the particular value of this angle. So that's the angle of the emission of a medium uh, gluon. In particular, the minimal value of this angle is achieved when the energy has a maximal value. Clearly, softer gluons have large angles and harder gluons have small angles. And the smallest angle is for the hardest gluon, which is omega c. And that turns out to be the, the, the critical value, the smallest value of the emission angle. It's called theta c, is this angle here. This ha ha appears to be a very small angle. I'll show you later. It's about 0 0.05. That's a typical value. So it's really a small angle. Now, the gluon is emitted during a time deformation time. And then after being formed, it keeps propagating through the medium. So while propagating, it still receives kicks from the medium. So his transit momentum keeps increasing. And it typically propagates over distance for the L, because it's produced anywhere inside the medium. So it has a distance of, if you are on the average, L over 2 to, to be, keep going through the medium. So through the propagation, out, 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 after the formation, it acquires additional momentum for the square root of Q hat L. And the, so the final angle will be typically bigger than the formation angle, because when it goes out of the medium, it has already acquired more transverse kicks, more transverse momentum. So its angle has been, has been increased from the emission angle to the final angle. So the real angle which matters for the particle distribution is not the formation angle, but is the final angle. And typically, the formation angle is very small as compared to the final angle, because the formation time is typically much more, much, much more than the medium size. So to, to summarize this slide, soft gluons, those with energies much more than omega c, have small formation times. Yeah, because that omega c corresponds to the maximum formation time, which is L. But if omega is much more than omega c, then the formation times is much more than L. So soft gluons, sorry, soft gluons have small formation times, and they have large production angles, much bigger than theta c. And the limiting angle theta c is only achieved for the limiting energy omega c. The hardest energy, the smallest angle, that's a, the that's a limit of the, of the spectrum. But the typical gluons with energy much more than this limit have much more formation times and much larger angles. In particular, those which are soft enough will have angles larger than the jet opting angle, which means that it will move outside the jet. 
So you already see how this radiation can lead to energy loss by the jet. It produces naturally soft particles at large angles, and those for which the angles are larger than the jet opening, they will be just lost by the jet. Okay, so now we know the spectrum, we have an idea about the distribution, let's try to compute some, some properties like energy loss. So I will not care about angular distribution anymore, so I integrate over k perp. I had a Gaussian here, this integration gives give me one, because it was a normal. And I will offer production everywhere inside the medium. So I consider the differential production for probability for a single emission, which occurs anywhere inside the medium with any k perp. I integrate over medium, this gives me a factor of L, because the pro differential probability was independent of the, of the formation time, of the emission time, of the point where it is emitted. Yeah. So I integrate over T, it gives me a factor of L, and I integrate over k perp, I just replace the Gaussian by one. And what I have, it's, it's alpha bar times L divided by formation times, and, and the one of omega from the Bremsstrom I put it on the, on the left hand side, so th this quantity now is dimensionless and has the meaning of a genuine probability. It's a differential probability times omega, which is a genuine probability. And I remind you that this expression here for the production rate, or for the spectrum, is valid only so long as omega, omega is more than omega c, with omega c being this cut energy. And we're mostly interested in energies much more than omega c. Now, using this, um, uh, this probability for emitting one gluon, let's compute the average energy loss by the, part, by the particle which is emitting, by the leading particle. If, assuming that it emits a single gluon, then the average energy loss is just the integration over the probability weighted by the energy over all the energies up to the upper limit which is allowed by, by this mechanism. And if you look at this function here, after the initial over omega, it, 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 it behaves like one was called of omega so that this integration here is cut off, is dominated by the upper limit, in fact. So the, the whole result is an alpha bar, or alpha s, times omega c, and omega c comes because I had a, one of the square root of omega, so I get a square root of omega c from the, from the upper limit here, times the square root of omega c from the, from the definition of the probability, makes a factor of omega c. So the average energy loss by the leading particle is alpha s times omega c. It is the maximum energy loss possible times the factor of alpha s. Why this factor of alpha s? Because, see, the, ener the, uh, um, the average energy loss is dominated by the hardest emission, because it takes the highest energy, which is omega s. But these hard emissions, when omega is omega s, are very rare events. They have probability of order alpha bar. So in order to have a hard emission, I have to pay a price. So I do get energy, uh, average energy, which is controlled by the hardest emissions, but I have this occur only with probability of order alpha s. So the average energy loss is the probability times the energy of one emission, alpha s and omega c. So these rare events, which take away a large energy, control the average energy loss by the leading particle. However, as I said before, such hard emission propagate at very small angles. Theta C was much more than the opening angle of the jet. So such hard emissions, they remain inside the jet. So the energy remains inside the jet. It's energy lost by the leading particle, but not by the jet. And that's not interesting, because you don't measure the leading particle, you measure only the jet. So this average energy loss associated with a single hard and rare emission, it's irrelevant for digital asymmetry. The, the, what is relevant will come later. So now I look what, what is relevant. I look again at this emission probability, and now I, ask the question, what is the typical energy loss? What's the typical radiation? Typical means probability of order one. So when this is of order one, I have a typical process, which occurs in any event, event by event, not in a rare event. Uh, this being of order one, you see, this becomes large if, if either L is large enough or omega is small enough. So you can solve the criterion that this is of order one when multiple branching becomes important in two ways. Either for a fixed L, I said, okay, this becomes of order one if the energy of the emission omega is small enough. How much small? Well, I want this to be of order one, so it is one if omega is equal to alpha squared times omega c, obviously. So for a size, for a fixed size medium L, all the gluon emissions energies of order this scale omega branching, which is alpha squared times omega c, which is alpha squared times two hundred squared parametrically. All such gluons which will, will be emitted with probability of order one, so I'll have for them multiple emissions. Vice versa, if I, if I fit the energy, I, I say, okay, I want to look at the emissions with a given energy omega, then in order for, the, for that gluon to be emitted with probability of order one, the medium should be large enough. Large size L should be larger than what's called the branching time 
depending upon omega, which is the condition of this of order one, you see the branch in time is, is, is equal to one over alpha bar times the, times the formation time. So what is this branch in time? It's a typical time between two emissions with energy omega. If omega is more than omega branching, this branching time is more than L, and I can have two such emissions. If, on the other hand, T branching is much bigger than L, I only have one emission and even less. Yes? Mm. It's not about the probability of interaction, it's about the probability of this. Uh, of, the, of the property of the spectrum. Um, yeah, that's, that's a good point. So wh why does it happen that uh, um, the high energy particles, right, so why the, why the high energy particles interact strongly with the medium in spite of having very high energy? Yeah. For instance, we know from the aircon approximation that high energy particles don't interact. What happens, that's a very good point. So this is why I, I mentioned that what is really important is the medium induced radiation, not the transit momentum browning. So what happens is that the effect of, uh, of the interaction is not a strong deviation of the particle. The particle is still aconal for by, by all reasons. I mean, it does not deviate. But even an infinitesimally small transfer of, of momentum in the, in the perpendicular direction can trigger radiation. And the energy of the radiated spectrum has nothing to do with the transfer energy from the medium. So a very small amount of transfer can give a bit of virtuality, and then the, 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 leading, the incoming particle being virtual can radiate, and it can radiate anything up to its own energy. How much it radiates depends upon the probability for, for the spectrum, which is in this case, this, this formula uh, here, I mean, in detail. But in any case, um, a priori, the radiation is not connected to the momentum transfer from the medium. So a soft momentum transfer for the medium has little effect in terms of momentum broadening, but has, can have huge effect in terms of radiation. So this is why in, in, um, um, radiation is the most important mechanism for energy loss. Because you have an energetic jet which gets very soft kicks from the medium, and in spite of that, he can radiate a lot because those kicks are putting him on shell, off shell, and once it is off shell, he can radiate independently of the medium. So that, that's a real mechanism. And this is what I'm describing in more detail, but you somehow manage to push me to make the, the point. So that's a good point in this. Okay. So, indeed, um, this is the, the spectrum, and this spectrum has the property that if you compute the expectation value of the energy loss, it's controlled by the upper limit, but this, uh, this refers to hard and rare emissions which, which remain inside the jet, so they don't, uh, they, they don't count for the energy loss by the jet. On the other hand, if we look now at softer emissions, we see how much softer. Energy of order alpha squared times the, the highest energy. So that's really a soft scale. If alpha is 0.3, this is 10 times more than omega c. Then this kind of soft emissions, they, they first, they're, they're, um, they're, um, they're typical events. They occur event by event. And moreover, uh, being softer, they will propagate naturally at larger angles. So they have a chance to go out of the jet. So I would like to argue that these softer emissions, which are the typical emissions, they do indeed control the energy loss by the jet. Let me, let me go on, on with the argument. So now let, let's look at the, at the typical event at LHC. The jets at LHC have a, hundred, a few hundred GeV, a minimal value is like 100 GeV. And if you use the typical values for Q hat and L, you find that this, uh, this typical scale for the, for the own set of multiple branching is like 5 GeV. It's not 5 GV because I told you that omega c is like 50 GV. This has an alpha squared, so it's like 5 GV. It's still a hard scale, reasonably hard scale, but it's not, it's more as compared to energy. So, emission, emissions with, 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 with energy of order omega branching or cool is probability of order 1. What does it mean? That in a typical event, the leading particle emits a number of order 1 of growing this energy. It can be 1, can be 2, not much bigger than 1, but it, it will be always at least 1 because it's, it's, that's a probability. If we, sorry. Okay. If now we ask the question, what is the number of emissions with energy much more than omega branching? They're zillions. Because the probability for them is much bigger than one. We need that they occur very, very often. In other terms, it means that the, the formation time, the branching time between two sources of emission for them is much more than the medium size. So for obviously, such very soft gluons will, will, will be myriads. 
However, they are irrelevant for the energy loss. The energy loss is controlled by the hardest primary emissions, which occurs probably for the one, which are those which are mega branching. So those which occur probably for the one, which are the hardest one, are those which matter. Those who are even harder than that are rare. They don't matter. Those which are softer than that are many, but they have no energy. They don't matter. So the focus should be on the on the gluon emissions of, any of, my, of this particular scale omega branching. In a typical event, have like one emission of this type. Because or two, so it can be once or twice. It's a number of 41 divided omega branching. This end is happening event by event, which I call delta E, is, is smaller than the average energy by a factor of alpha bar, because the average energy was alpha bar times omega C, right? Was alpha bar times omega C. And now this, this typical scale omega branch is alpha squared times omega C, so one alpha, alpha bar, uh, on top. So it is smaller, yet it is more important for our purposes because this happens to be the energy loss by the jet. And why? Well, as soon as we start by having a gluon emission with energy omega of, of, of this kind of omega branching, this energy, this, this gluon itself is bound to branch again and again and again until it dissipates its own energy into many soft quanta propagating at large angle. And this is so because, in fact, this gluon now obeys a different branching law, not a standard branch traveling. And because of this modified branching law, which is typical to the medium, it undergoes what's called democratic branching, which means that the typical energy fractions here are comparable. So unlike in, in a standard breakdown in the vacuum, which favor very asymmetric splittings, when one of the gluon is much softer than the other one, so eta z is much more than one, or one z is much more than one, the, the branching occurring inside the medium are quasi democratic. They, 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 they don't uh, distinguish between the two, two intergluons. And how can you understand that? Let's look at the probability for these gluons to split into two, two, these total, total gluons, z omega and one minus z omega. We apply the same law as before. The probability for this splitting is a medium size, which I, uh, this omitted anyone inside the news is right, like medium size, divided by the typical time between two, two, two emissions from here to there. The typical time between two, the, between two emissions is controlled by the energy of the daughter particle, z omega. You know, this is the same formula as I said before. The same formula as I said here. But I just depress what alpha bar divided by tau medium as, as inverse of tau branching by using this formula. And here was energy omega of the emitted gluon. And I do the same here. The energy of the emitted gluon is z omega, right? So I put z omega here. The parent now is omega. That's the formula coming from this probability. The situation omega itself is such that even independently of that, this probability is for the one. So the probability of for the one, whatever that is, then we don't need soft enhancement to have a probability of for the one. But this probability, this, this, this law for radiation doesn't care about that. And then the interaction over that would just think allow any value of that. So in that sense, there's any value of that is equally probable, and there is no dominance of small values of that. So there is no bias to what asymmetric splitting. And then it's automatically um, democratic splitting. So, the democratic branch is, is very unusual in the context of gauge theories, as I just mentioned. And it is extremely important for, for the fields at hand because it is very efficient in redistributing the energy among softer quanta. All the energy of the, of the first primary gluon here disappears into many quanta which are arbitrarily soft because this, this, uh, this uh, branching process interacts itself. And in a type of the order of the life cycle of the first gluon, the whole cascade disappears. And the energy is to arbitrary soft gluons, which can go to arbitrary large angles. So in this way, all the energy carried by the primary gluons ends up outside the jet cone at arbitrary large angles, and it's lost. So this energy given by the typical energy loss by, by the living particle is also automatically energy loss by the whole jet, because even if the primary gluon was inside the jet, the secondary gluon and so on are bound to, to, to be eventually out of the jet because they're being arbitrary soft. So the energy taken by this primary gluon eventually appears in many soft quanta propagated at large angles, which is precisely what we need for explaining that asymmetry at the MFC. And this, uh, this dynamics has also 
uh, a nice uh, mathematical um, connection to the, which also related to what Fiora was speaking, with the phenomenon of turbulence. Uh, the, 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 uh, one of the definitions of turbulence is that uh, when you have a turbulent process, the energy flows from one generation to the next one without, uh, at a constant rate, which is independent of the generation. Such a way that the, the whole energy will start in the linear particle, then it is in, this, in, the, in the primary gluons, then the secondary one, and so on. And eventually, this whole energy flows at, into arbitrary soft modes. If there is no, no, no mechanism to cut off this flow, the energy accumulates into a condensate at zero energy. In reality, of course, when the energy becomes compact with the medium temperature, T, then it's going to be uh, thermalization via elastic collisions. But in any case, such a process of, of turbulent flow uh, has the property to, to very efficiently transmit the energy from the living parton to the thermal scale. And that's very similar to the Kolmogorov of turbulence for vortices in the air, where the energy of the big vortices goes into the small vortices, so on, so on, until it is transmitted to, to, to the, to the uh, air via dissipation. The dissipation plays a same role as the elastic collision here. Uh, but this cascade we're speaking here, it's, it's, uh, it's different. In fact, it's very simple. It's one plus one dimension. It's only the energy. And also, it's an inverse cascade. The energy goes from, we, the energy goes from hard modes to soft modes, unlike the uh, uh, strata cascade that, uh, that's what I was speaking about, where the, um, the energy goes from large scale to small scale, we mean from, from soft modes to hard modes. It's a, it's a ultra violent cascade, it's an infrared cascade. But otherwise, the physics is very similar. But because it's so simple, for this cascade, we have simple mathematics. Even our exact solution in some limits I'll show you in a moment. OK, uh, so this whole process of mini jets, which you, which you evolve via democratic branchings, uh, can be taken as a, as a classical uh, Markovian stochastic process. Why is it Markovian? Because the successive emissions are independent from each other. There are two arguments for that. First, the successive branchings are not overlapping. They're not overlapping because, as I try to emphasize here, the typical time between two successive emissions is much larger by a factor of one over alpha s than the typical duration of a single emission. So this emission and this emission don't talk to each other, at least not in the sense of formation time, they don't overlap in green formation. And moreover, there, there are no interference phenomena which could complicate the picture. Yesterday I was speaking about angular order in the vacuum. In general, color coherence is important, but in, 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 for the case of the medium induced radiation, color coherence is washed out by the scattering of the medium, I'll show you in a, in a moment. And because of that, we can speak about the uh, uh, Markovian process, and for this one, we can write, uh, we have, we know the rate, the rate is just the BDMPS uh, spectrum. So once we know the rate, and we know it's a, it's a Markovian process, we can write uh, the probability distribution, we can write uh, um, uh, Monte Carlo, we can write kinetic equations, and all that was done. Uh, and I'll, I'll show some results in what follows. And I'll, to again, I'll discuss about the Monte Carlo uh, implementation of this whole process. To, and, and Paul will also discuss more about that in his talk next week. Uh, so, but, but before I, I, I develop in more detail this, the theory of this Markovian process, let me explain to you why um, the interference phenomena are washed out for the medium induced radiation. Why there is no angular ordering? Well, why there is no color coherence? That's important for us, fellows. So, to understand physically what happens in the medium with the color coherence. So, for that time, I again start like yesterday with a colorless antenna, with a quark anti quark pair in a colorless state, uh, color stingless state, which makes an angle theta. Color stingless because it's easier to speak about the, the lack of color coherence. If the, so long as the, the antenna remains a color stingless, it, it preserves color coherence. When it be, it's not a color stingless anymore, it, the color coherence was, was, was lost. Um, now, in the vacuum, the quark, the anti quark propagate. Uh, but they, they keep their, their, they remain a color stingless state until one of them emits for the first time. But in the medium, in, independently of any emissions, the quark and the gluons scatter independently of the, of the particles in the medium. Because they scatter, each of them can transfer color from the medium to the, to the pattern. They exchange color. And they do that independently because the, the, uh, the scattering partners are, are independent from each other. The instantaneous color state of each of these two quarks is given by the respective Wilson line. And the, and the color entanglement between the two is given by the dipole S matrix. I mean that the dipole S matrix with the trace of the two Wilson lines is the probability for the single, for the, for the, for the, for the quark and dipole pair to remain in a single state. And that's what we like to understand. We like to understand, do 
does this, this antenna remain in a color similar state in spite of the scattering or not? And the question should be, of course, it does not. Eventually, it will, it will die, the, 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 the coloration will die out because of the scattering. And to find out how fast it dies out, it's good enough to compute this dipolar matrix, which measure the correlation. So I, I try to show here uh, the, 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 the evolution of the color vector. So at the beginning, I had a colorless antenna. So the quark and the anti quark have their color vectors in the fundamental vegetation back to back in the color space. So it was zero color. But then each of these color vectors undergoes precession by, by the scatterings. And at some later time, they have arbitrary directions. When they have arbitrary directions, the color of that, that state, which is the sum of this plus this, is non zero, obviously. So, uh, and the S matrix is, is giving us the probability that at some later time, they're still aligned like that, which will, of course means more than one. And to, to compute the, the color mat, the, the, the dipole matrix, you already know the, the argument by now, is it, 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 essentially exponential of Q hat times the, uh, the size squared of the, of the dipole integrated over all the times. In this case, the size of the dipole grows with time, obviously. The size of the dipole is theta t. So when I integrate over time from, from the zero to the final time, I get a factor t cube from this integration times t theta squared from the, from the angle here. So I have theta t times squared. So this is the way how the S matrix decays with time, and, and the color in, uh, correlation is lost when the exponent here is, of course, the one, because then the S matrix is much more than one. And this happens if t is large enough. How much large? Well, as large as this value, the, the decoherent time, which depends on Q hat, because we need scatterings to have the decoherence, and depends on the initial angle theta of the antenna, because the larger the angle, the faster the, 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 faster the, the quartz and anti quartz separate from each other, so the, str the stronger is the, the correlation. So that's, that's the, the typical value of tennis papers for the decoherence time, which shows that the antenna loses its color coherence after this time for an antenna with a given theta. Now, if you apply this result to the particular case of the medium induced radiation, then the theta here is not a generic value like here, but it is fixed by the, uh, as the angle of the formation time. And I showed you before what was the angle of the formation time, so you can find that with the expression. So I just plug in this particular angle in the formula for the decoherence time, and I found out that the decoherence time is the same as the formation time. So if, if this blob here, the, the, this gray blob, represents the formation time, then by the time this quark, these two gluons, sorry, are, are formed, so they separate from each other, they're also color decoherent. So implicitly, the mechanism of, of medium radiation is a mechanism of color decoherence. It's not the case with vacuum. The vacuum, the particles are created by a vertex, they color coherent with each other all the way up to the first emission. But here, the only reason why these two gluons separate from each other and become two independent particles is because they have lost their color coherence via scattering during the formation time. So if you by definition, they are color decoherent because that's the way how they get, get on shell, by losing their color coherence. So I just give the argument here for, for definiteness, but that's, in fact, that's, a, in, that's a heart of the argument by, by, by the Bayer and company. They said this medium emission occurs because the two particles lose their color coherence and they, the what happens. So because, but because they lost their color coils, then the subsequent emission from the two legs are independent from each other, no interference, no angular ordering, a, a, a simple Brownian motion, sorry, a simple Markovian motion, um, sorry, process uh, can, can work without any angular ordering. Okay. So now, now we know we have a simple process, a Markovian process. Yeah, sorry. So, I mean, so, so this is true for the, I mean, this is theta made of omega, right? So this is true for the typical gluon that you radiate, right? Yes. But say if you want to calculate energy loss, you're actually not dominated by that energy, a part on energy loss. I mean, not jet energy loss, right? Then you're actually not no, no, dominated no, by the, the typical, the, the, but you're dominated by other things, right? So, so you're fully so right then the story it, gets more complicated, right? For, for, so, so, all, so let me say more precisely, this whole argument is valid so long as the formation time is so much more than L. It means that so long the energy is much more than omega c. But this omega c plays no role in physics. It only plays a role to give a scale for omega branching, which is alpha square times omega c. So the real physical scale for, for, for a jet in a medium is omega branching. Just for historical reasons, people were discussing about the energy loss by, the, by, by a single hadron, because they had no jet. In that case, omega c was the, was the relevant scale. And if you look at very inclusive observables, I guess I agree, right? But I mean, if you, I mean, if you look at more sort of substructure of the jet or something like this, I mean, then you will get sensitive to the fact. I mean, to, to rare harder branch in spite of the so the jet, both scales are important, yes. But uh, still... Um, okay, but but you, what you're going to discuss is not the typical... Let me say something else. 
uh, as soon as this energy here is close to the upper neutral omega C, then the formation time is for the L. Then the probability of having two emissions, two phase emissions is for the, is of, is for the alpha squared is small. So the, the, the notion of, of multiple branchings and of interferences makes sense only for those emissions which are soft enough to be repeated. The hard emissions are rare events. You can have one of them every one of alpha S events, but you never have two of them. So the speaking about interference between the suitable hard emissions, it's complicated and irrelevant. But I, I, otherwise, you're fully right. This, this argument is only valid for soft emissions which have sh small formation time. And the whole theory I'm developing now is rigorous only for the, so the, the full BDMP as that spectrum has a different shape when you approach omega C, but that, that's not so important. Um, so now, now I just play with this, uh, with the statistical physics problem. A classical statistical physics problem, I have a branching rate, which is a, this blob here, the BDMPS rate, and, and I want to look at some observable, say the spectrum. The spectrum is the number of, of gluons with a given value of x times x, where x is energy fraction. So x is, the, uh, if the gluon has energy omega, and the leading particle has energy e, x omega divided by e. And I, w I can write a kinetic equation, a rate equation, which shows how the spectrum evolves with time due to one additional emission. I have a rate, the rate is given by the BDMP as the spectrum, and I, in one step of the evolution, I think I can add one more particle at x because I had a parent particle with a fraction, uh, with any fraction x over z, who had radiated a gluon with a, uh, we had a, made a splitting here, uh, in such a way that this gluon has taken fraction z and it's one minus z, and of course uh, z is integrated over, but uh, uh, it, it, uh, as you see, the, 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 the final value x is fixed from the outside, and uh, uh, by integrating over of x over z, I have a, have a kernel which tells me the probability for a gluon with energy fraction x over z split a gluon with energy fraction x. That's BDMPS kernel. And of course, I want to have a visual correction and a loss term in which I start with the gluon x, which splits into two, two gluons z x and one minus z x. In this way, the gluon x has disappeared. So this rate equation is telling me how I create or I destroy particles a given x by particles larger x or by going to particles more x. It's a standard kinetic equation. And this equation is simple enough to be solved exactly analytically uh, with the initial condition that at time zero, I only have the leading particle, so I have delta of x minus one in these variables. And that's the exact solution to it, where tau is the time in appropriate units, in units of the branch in time of the leading particle. So when tau is one, the, branch, the leading particle itself undergoes the democratic branching. That's, that means that the, part, the leading particle disappears. Of course, at the other extreme, the, typical, the, the, the energy of the leading particle is so high that the branch in time is much bigger than the minimum size, L, so this value of tau is much more than one. But in, in principle, you can use this equation to play with any value of tau. And uh, what is specific about uh, uh, this spectrum is that it shows this, uh, this, uh, this uh, turbulent behavior I was mentioning before. So if you look at, at small x, where x is much more than one, so you can get that, you can see that this spectrum is uh, the same as one was square root of x, this is the same as the BDMPS spectrum, but it is not valid only for a single emission. It is valid even if you have arbitrary many emissions. So the BDMPS spectrum is just the one emission, it's just the rate for this. But even if you solve the case with arbitrary many, many emissions, the spectrum is invariant, it's self-constructing, it is it's self similar. And that's because it's turbulent spectrum. And uh, this is fixed point, the Kolmogorov fixed point, which is, which is, um, which is, um, which is what's called wave turbulence. And this is the, the numerical result or analytic result, uh, which you cannot use. So that's the spectrum uh, produced by the leading particle uh, after time, under the condition that the leading particle has an energy which is five times its biggest energy, which is like 50 times big, uh, bigger than the omega branching. So that's the remnant of the leading particle. The leading particle is still there. It has lost some energy, but it's still there. That's the energy lost by the leading particle. It goes into radiation. You see, this is omega C, so there's no energy lost above omega C because one cannot radiate gluons with energy above omega C, so omega C is 0.2 in this case. Omega C by E is equal to 0.2. So there's a gap in the spectrum. And uh, the energy in the radiated spectrum goes like one, one was square root of x. And to see that clearly, I, I show here just the radiated spectrum multiplied by square root of x, and see it's, it's, per, it's a perfect straight line. So that's a, um, and that's why for a, for a given value of the time, that, 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 that this property is a, a time invariant. Happens though with time that the energy goes away from the spectrum, it, it moves to, to to softer and softer quanta and accumulates at, at, at x equal zero eventually. So 
as I said, I just, just said, the energy leaks into a condense at x equal to zero because we have no thermalization, otherwise we just go to the medium. Because of, uh, how can you check that? Well, you see, you just compute the energy fraction which remains inside the jet. You integrate the spectrum over all the values of x from zero to one. And you don't find one. Because the energy goes away from the spectrum. You find something which is decreasing with time. You see, if time is large enough, this goes to zero. The whole energy goes away from the spectrum. Now, this energy goes into a condensate, which means it goes at x to the zero, which means it goes into a very soft gluons, which means it goes at very large angles. So this whole energy is formally recovered as energy loss at a very large angle. So the energy which is missing from the spectrum, which is a total energy minus the energy which remains in the spectrum, which is here, is the energy loss at very large angle. That we express in terms of these uh, um, special units, but if you return to the physical units, uh, this, uh, this uh, energy loss at very large angles is the same as uh, uh, one minus this exponential, which includes the, the energy of the incoming particle and the typical scale for energy loss in the plasma, which is omega branching, which is alpha squared to hetal squared in this uh, ratio. So you see that, that you see clearly that uh, the scale which is relevant for energy loss is this softer scale omega branch, is not omega C. So that's, a, well, that's an expression, and the exact result, but if you look now at the LHC, I remind that at the LHC, E is much bigger than omega branch, so we can expand the exponential to leading order, and if we do so, then the E dependence goes away, so the average energy loss uh, at very large angles for the jet as a whole, not for the leading particle, it's a, it's a constant, which is a number that happens to be 2 pi times this intrinsic scale. Now, this is only the energy loss at very, very large angles, but in fact, uh, there's an additional condition to that, which is, which is this angle independent, but one is angle dependent, which comes from the soft modes in the spectrum. Because if the modes are soft enough, if the energy is omega is small enough, their propagation angle can be larger than the, the jet angle, op opening angle, so then they will go at, at, uh, outside of the cone axis. So on top on the energy which is going into the condensate, one should also add the energy which is in the part of the spectrum at very small x, in such a way that, uh, that we compute all the energy which, which, which went away from, from the jet. That's a total energy loss uh, uh, by, by, the, by, the, by the jet in this, um, in this mechanism. And this, uh, this, this, uh, this mechanism has the right feature to explain the digital symmetry of cell the LHC. I show here some, some, some data from CMS. We just show the, uh, the profile of energy in, in, in angle starting from the jet axis. So this is a jet. The jet has, uh, has a, say, an uh, opening angle like 0.4, but they keep looking at the energy distribution outside the jet up to angles as large as one. And you see that if, uh, if you go outside the jet above 0.4, there's an excess in the jet. This is the ratio of proton, lead lead divided by proton proton. There's an excess in, 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 in lead lead compared to proton proton if you look at very soft modes. So outside of the jet, there's a huge excess in lead lead as compared to proton proton. Well, from the hard modes, there's a deficit because the hard modes don't exist anymore. They lost energy. But this is precisely this profile is with uh, this, this is precisely consistent with the distribution of, of delta R coming from this argument that I didn't show here for, for simplicity, but this is fully consistent, this picture is fully consistent. So we have a lot of energy outside the jet at large angle, carried by soft part. Okay, uh, and the, 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 uh, as, I, as I mentioned before, this whole scheme, the Markovian, can be, uh, can be um, uh, implemented into a Monte Carlo. Uh, we have done that, and these are uh, results from the, from the Monte Carlo. Uh, the Monte Carlo is much more complicated, I'll show later uh, more about that, but this is just the Monte Carlo uh, uh, applied to the medium induced radiation, and this is the energy distribution, um, the spectrum, I showed you before, the spectrum inside, uh, uh, inside the jets, which are produced by leading particles with different energies. You see, that's the energy of the leading particle, the, the, peak, the highest peak here has 500 GeV, and then we have different curves corresponding to leading particles, energy going from 500 down to 5. And, uh, so long as the energy of the leading particle is high enough, you see a well-defined uh, leading particle peak. And then you see a spectrum at low, uh, low uh, energy, which is described the radiation. All that corresponds precisely what I showed you here analytically. So that leading particle peak, that's a spectrum at low X. But here the spectrum was going down to arbitrary, down to arbitrary soft energy because I have no, no angular opening on the, on the jet. Whereas here we have Define the jet with a given angular opening, r equal one. So everything which is outside r equal one 
is not counted as a part of the jet, so the distribution goes to zero. So the spectrum is one over square root of x up to the edge of the of the jet, and then the energy going, uh, um, the uh, softer energies would go outside of the jet, so they don't count it anymore. So just the spectrum is then remaining down. And this is again from the Monte Carlo, the distribution, the average, and the, uh, and the, uh, the expectation value, the error by the, uh, sorry, uh, the dispersion for it, the expectation, the expectation value and the dispersion is the energy loss at large angles, including both this mechanism, what I mentioned here, so the energy associated with the condensate and the energy associated with the, with the soft mode in the spectrum. So essentially, is this the sum of this part plus the part coming from here. And um, you see that if you increase the energy of the, so the, the different uh, beams correspond to different energy of the leading particle. If the leading particle is relatively soft, like 5 to 10 GeV, then the energy loss is dramatically dependent on the energy of the leading particle. The higher the energy of the leading particle, the higher the energy loss. This is precisely what happens if you take this formula here, and you say that E is more as compared to omega branching, or comparable to omega branching. On the other hand, if you go to E much bigger than omega branching, then this energy loss becomes independent of, of E, and this is what happens in the Monte Carlo, you see that if you go to very high, uh, to very high PT, so these PT is here, uh, order 500, 200, 100, 500, 200, 100, then the energy loss is essentially the same for all these uh, original jets, uh, because it's become independent of the energy of the jet. And um, we also vary here the, the, the opening air of the jet, uh, the smallest angle in point two corresponds to the red point, the biggest angle is one corresponds to the uh, black uh, uh, rhomboids, and when you increase the, 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 the angle of the jet, you decrease the energy loss because there is a part of the energy at a large angle that you capture inside of the jet. But eventually, when you keep increasing the, 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 the angle, the uh, angle oming of the jet, say from 0.8 to 1, you don't, get, you don't win much energy. Because why? Because all the energy, in fact, this condensate energy has gone to arbitrary large angles. So by just changing the angle from 0.6 to 0.8 to 0.1, we don't recover that. That is at pi, right? It's in, it's in the underlying event. So it's not good enough to rise a bit the jet opening to find it. And that's one of the most striking observations at the LHC. The fact that you have, okay, you have a jet, you have lost energy. You say, okay, the energy has been radiated outside of the jet. If it was like collinear radiation, the energy which is lost is lost at angles just outside the jet. So if you increase a bit the jet opening, you find that missing energy. You increase even more, you find even more of the, uh, of the missing energy. And you very rapidly recover the energy loss by increasing the jet opening. That would be the case for standard jets. But this jet has the property that, so independently how much you increase the jet opening angle, you still find the missing energy. Because the energy has just gone into the event. It's not there. And that's what, what you see in the data, you see. Here, after some angle, there's no increase anymore. It flattens out. You can increase the angle from 0.6 to 1. You don't get more energy. Energy is lost. What we also see here. You come from, from 0.6 to 0.8 to, 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 to 1. The difference in energy loss is very small because this whole energy which is lost here is lost at angles much bigger than 1. Okay. Uh, so far, so good with medium induced radiation. Now I'd like to, to return to also add vacuum life fluctuations. So, uh, if there are questions, so by vacuum light emission, sorry, so you other questions at this point. What time it is? Okay, I still have like 20 minutes, half hour maybe. This stopped, I don't know why what happens. So, it's not going to ring, but I'm not going to use that in my favor, though. No question? Okay, please, Rob. I mean, perhaps I should ask you this question at the end, mm -hmm. but um, there are detailed uh, structure of jets that you might hope to distinguish, for example, between gluon jets, oh, yes. or jets, or between the structure. I mean, there's this peculiar thing that, at least perhaps you can correct me, that the apparent size of the energy deposition in uh, jet, the project, gluon jets. Proton, proton is the same as in uh, medium, and things that make no sense and are clearly due to our inadequacies in pulling apart the structure of um, jets in medium versus that in vacuum. Now, it, it's not meant to be a criticism. Mm -hmm. it, it's clearly something where you have to do, I, everything you're describing is absolutely necessary, 
but it's not complete. Until we can tell the difference between a gluon jet and a quark jet, and me, this oh, but the, in, in what we are doing here is trivial. This difference, so I, I don't think about the other ones, the position that I don't understand. But the the, 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 the difference between the gluon jet and a quark jet in PQCD is trivial because the, so we have Monte Carlo, we, we, we generated events with both, of course. And you see a tremendous difference in energy. So it's even more than you expect. So a jet initiated by a gluon loses much more energy than a jet initiated by a quark. Essentially, it, it is a factor, a factor of two, like eight over three. If you look. But uh, if you look at the plot, it looks tremendously much more. So it looks like the gluons are much more active than the, than the quarks, and they are indeed. But I think it's easier because you have the polar factor from the very beginning of the vertex. Um, and, and we didn't try to, 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 to see if our uh, uh, simulations are, uh, uh, because in the, in, the, in the data it's difficult to distinguish unambiguously jet coming from gluons and coming from quarks. In what we're doing in Monte Carlo, we can't by hand. So this, this, this difference is obvious indeed. But there are other aspects like the energy deposition. We don't have a detailed um, description of what happens in a, in a, uh, at large angles outside the jet. We only follow the emissions inside the jet, and when they go out of the jet, we declare them lost. So we don't know where it is deposited exactly. Also because we don't have a reality description of the medium. We don't have like hydro for the medium. We don't have bad reaction of the medium. So saying that uh, a very soft gluon went exactly at an angle of four over three, five over three would be meaningless because of course that would happen if it was not really scattering in the medium, but it can thermalize, it can go whatever like. So we just want to see how much energy is lost by the jet. For that purpose, we follow what happened inside the jet. The, jet, the particle going outside to condom as lost. And then, but on the other hand, what happens inside the jet, we like to describe in detail, now we're talking now this fragmentation functions, is a very detailed information about the jet, which in our opinion still um, be, um, can be computed in perturbation theory, because they're less uh, sensitive to, to the dead gas of the jet and stuff like that, they're more sensitive to the branching process itself. So the interest, so their, their modification of the jet inside the jet cone, which are as important as the energy loss at large angles, and this is what's called the fragmentation function, and I'll return to that in a moment. And these modifications, we believe, can be computed from PKCD, and indeed, we, we get very good description of this data. Uh, Paul will give some other example of this. So everything which happens inside the jet, in my opinion, should be understood more in PQCD. Whereas the energy loss as a whole, as an inclusive quantity, should be also understandable, but his precise deposition in the background event around the jet is more complicated, because it really requires a, detailed knowledge of the medium properties on the soft scale. Okay, so the, I, I just can't what, what Rob was saying. So, so far we only focus... Sorry? C energies, you, you can do this kind of separation. Do, do you think the energies at S Phoenix are sufficiently high to allow... We didn't wait. We, we, we so far... Well, as you can see, we have uh, results here for jets which are very low, like Phoenix jets, right? Uh, we didn't try to see if any of these results from here match anything at, at Phoenix. We just, first of all, we, we just started, we have not even published this data, so the results. But all I'm going to show is here now, it, it fits perfectly uh, for, for all these kind of po points at, at the LHC, there's no problem to describe them. We didn't try for low energy yet, you see. That, that remains the same. So what I want to say that so far I, 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 forgot, I have forgotten about the vacuum light -like emissions because the purpose was to describe the energy lost at large angles and that was only associated with medium induced emissions. And in particular, that mechanism I just showed, it, it predicted, it was, predicted to, uh, was predicting an, an energy loss which approaches a constant value at high energy, right? That's this point, see, the, the high energy, the energy loss is the same. And that's because, well, this, this is the energy which is, the, 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 is, is this value here, which is just uh, give, uh, given by the medium scale. Now, this, uh, this statement that the energy loss is independent of the energy of the leading particle is not in agreement with the data. Because the data, as I emphasized in my, my yesterday talk, show that the nuclear modification factor is flat at high energy of the jet, as, at, uh, as, as high as one TeV. So if a TeV jet was losing exactly the same energy as a 100 GeV jet, or 200 GeV jet, then the effect from the nuclear modification factor should have been much smaller for the 1 TeV than from the 200 one. But the effect is the same, which means that in reality, the, two, the uh, 1 TeV jet loses more energy than 200 GeV. Because in such a way that the ratio stays flat. So we, we need an effect which increases with the jet energy. 
This doesn't mean that my previous discussion was wrong. But in my previous discussion, I was neglecting the part of dynamics. I was assuming that I have a single leading particle which can only radiate medium in these gluons. But what if this particle can radiate also vacuum like emissions? And these vacuum like emissions can each of them independently radiate medium induced radiation. The higher the energy of the leading particle, the more the phase space for vacuum like emissions. The, the more the, the, the particles produced inside the jet by standard vacuum like radiation, and each of these particles becomes a source for medium induced radiation. So this planet appears in our calculation, I'll show that it appears really, without any doubt, it appears because with increasing the PT, we increase the phase space for, for vacuum light radiation, so increase the, we increase the number of sources for medium induced radiation. Each of these sources emits essentially loses the same energy because they all lose energy according to this mechanism. But the number of the sources increasing with PT, and this precisely explains this flatness here. Another aspect that we'd like to be able to explain is this funny um, shape of the fragmentation function, the ratio of fragmentation function in lead lead uh, compared to proton proton, where I have the same angle as small x, and this, this uh, suppression and intermediate value of, of, of x, z is the same as x, it's the energy fraction of the hydrogen in the jet. So all that refers to modification of the jet structure inside the cone. So this is the distribution of the particle inside of the jet core. At, uh, in this case, for a jet with error point, point 0.4. So even inside the jet, there is a strong difference between jets in the lead lead and jets in, in PP, and this is uh, reflected by this observable, the rest of the fragmentation function. So to explain this flatness here, or this shape there, we need to restore the vacuum light emission. We need a, a theory for both vacuum light and medium induced. Well, so let me discuss for you about vacuum light emissions inside the medium. Let me ask you, what do you mean by that? Are there vacuum light is there in the medium? Well, what I mean is simply emissions which are triggered by the part of virtualities and not by cause in the medium. If they're triggered by the part of virtualities, can they be different from the standard part of showers in the vacuum as given by Bremsstahlin? Of course they can, because there are many constraints on top of, on the standard Bremsstahlin which, which appears in the medium. First of all, the vacuum-like emissions occurring inside the medium have a restricted phase space. I remember that in order to, to be vacuum-like, they have to be prompt enough. They have to have a formation time much more than this upper limit introduced for the medium, for the given energy. Or requirement is they have to, to, to have emission angles, theta, which are large enough, so they know coiner similarity, because the emission angle for these jets, for this, sorry, for this, uh, for these emissions, should be larger than this typical scale set by the medium. So they are large angle, short formation time emissions. If they don't satisfy this criteria, they cannot exist. So there is a constraint as compared to the vacuum. Moreover, after being created, this, uh, this vacuum-like emissions, they can undergo, they can become themselves sources for medium-induced emissions. So they can suffer energy loss and momentum browning. So they modified. They are emitted right in the vacuum, but then they are modified by the medium. In particular, the, the angular ordering property of the cascade can be affected by the medium scattering. So I have the same mechanism for a single emission, but when I have many emissions, the question is what about the color coherence? Is the color coherence co the same as in the vacuum or, the, or it's modified by the medium? Is there still angular ordering? So there are a lot of questions to be addressed, even if we speak about vacuum like emission. They're vacuum like in the sense of being triggered by virtualities, but otherwise they can be modified by the medium in many ways. And uh, since I discussed here about constraints in the phase space, it's, it's, it's useful to have a graphic representation of the phase space. That's called the loom plot, and I, or the loom plane. And I'll show that, uh, the, the, uh, that representation first on the example of genuine pattern charge in the vacuum, saying the double dynamic approximation for, 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 for simplicity. So this is uh, the, the phase space for radiation, the, the phase space being the energy phase space and the angular phase space. So we have a two-dimensional plot where one, one axis have the energy and the other axis have the angle theta. And each emission, each, each uh, branch in here is, is represented by a point in this phase space. That point represents the energy omega i and the emission angle theta i of the softest gluon in the emission. I have an emission here, one gluon fits in two gluons, one is softer than the other one, so for the softer one I, I record his energy and his theta as a point here. So if the jet has a maximum angle theta bar as given by the, by the first emission and it has an energy of the particle E, then the first emission can have an angle which is theta bar and a maximum energy with E, and then the, the next emission has an angle which is more than theta, theta bar, say theta one, and energy omega one is more than E. The second next emission has an angle theta two, which is even more than theta one, 
and, and energy, which is even omega two, which is even more than omega one, and so on. So here I present for you a, a, a cascade which is strongly ordered, both in energy and in and angles, what's called a double line approximation cascade, because that's a typical cascade in the vacuum. So I have strong ordering because you see this is a line phase space. So going from here to here in, implies a dramatic decrease in the angle and so in the energy and in the angle. And the, uh, these cascades keep propagating towards, towards more energy and so lower angles until it hits a hydrogenization barrier. So when the transit momentum of the produced particle becomes comparable with lambda QCD, then I cannot speak about partial branching anymore. I have to introduce a, mo a moment of, of a model of hydronization, and from my our purpose, we, ju we shall just stop the cascade there. So the hydronization line in this uh, omega in the, this omega theta plane is a line of transverse k up, which means transverse omega theta and trans uh, fixed uh, transverse uh, tra fixed omega theta for the lambda QCD, and the line omega theta is the lambda QCD in this line. Here. So that's a phase space. Uh, allowed to vacuum radiation in the double running approximation. This phase space is, is forbidden because of confinement. And now I'd like to show how this phase space is modified or, or when also adding the medium constraint. So this is shown here. Uh, so I, I just mentioned before that, uh, that the um, vacuum light emission occurring inside the medium have to be prompt. They have to have formation times much smaller than the this typical scale produced by the medium. The, the, the equality between these two scales is a line, is the same as the line, if you want, that theta is equal to, to this particle value. So in omega theta plane, this is a line, because I have omega and theta as a variable, have the equality between them gives me a line. It is this line here, you see, omega cube theta four is how to you have. So emissions which are vacuum line, which occur inside the medium, can be anywhere on the right on this line because on the right of this, of this line, they obey this condition. But vacuum-like emission can also occur outside the medium. In that case, they're not concerned any longer, but they have to have formation time bigger than L. So I can have a vacuum-like emission here or there, anywhere down to the hydrogenization line. On the other hand, I cannot have any vacuum-like emissions within these two lines, because that will correspond to emissions inside the medium, because that's the medium line, so the medium battery is here. So I have emission inside the medium, but which, which violate this condition. So you see that the, 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 the very existence of medium rescattering introduces a forbidden region in the phase space for vacuum light radiation. I would have less vacuum light radiation. This Vito region is, this, is defined by the, by the region between these two lines, the line where this is equal to that and the line where this is equal to that. And these two lines meet at the point, and this point is precisely this upper limit omega c on the energy of the medium reduced emissions, and the corresponding angles, of course, theta c, because you, I mind that omega c and theta c correspond to each other. So this is the smallest angle for medium induced radiation. This is the largest energy for medium radiation. So the energy goes like that. This is energy of the living particle, and this is omega c, which is the highest energy for medium induced radiation. All emissions between omega c and e are by definition vacuum like because they cannot compete with any medium induced. But all the emissions on the left on omega c can be either medium induced or vacuum like. If they're on the right of this line, they're vacuum like. If they're in the Vito region, they're medium induced. Since, so this is Vito only for the medium induced, of course. Sorry, it's Vito only for the vacuum like. It is allowed for the medium induced. But now I'm thinking about the vacuum like, and from the point of view of vacuum like, this phase space does not exist. It is one here and one there. Moreover, since the formation times are so short, we are speaking about the right scales, right? So the formation time of this one is much, much more than, than L. Then one can ignore energy loss and PT Browning doing formation. So this, cas this whole cascade is created exactly like in the vacuum, except for the fact that there is no uh, emission inside the Vito region. But before speaking about um, um, uh, the, the characteristics of the cascade, we, one should also understand what is the Coral coherence. Is this a cascade angular order or not? The, the folklore was saying that cascades inside the medium cannot be angular ordered because medium destroys coral coherence. I told you before that in medium scattering washes out the coral coherence. So there is no coral coherence, there should be no angular ordering. And I'd like to show that this is not, not right. These cascades are angular ordered like in the vacuum. That's, that's, that's very non trivial too. So what happened? Well, first of all, in the, in the, in the, in the vacuum, we have, we have angular ordering because uh, emissions at large angles are destroyed by the inter interference. This gluon can overlap with both the quark and the anti-quark, so if you are in the vacuum, this gluon is emitted from the zero, uh, all from the global charge to zero, so this emission is forbidden. Now, if you go into the medium, uh, where we discussed before, that there is a time, the coherence time, after which the incoming antenna loses the coral coherence. 
So if I have an emission at times, formation times more than this T coherence, it is still forbidden because doing times much more than T coherence, the antenna is still coherent. It's, it's still coherent with each other, so you cannot write a large angle. On the other hand, emissions at very large formation times, much bigger than coherence, are emitted from incoherent antenna. In that case, this quark and the anti quark don't know about the color charges any longer, and uh, this, there is no interference anymore. So, in, so in principle, uh, uh, such emission at large angle is allowed because there is no color coherence anymore at, at, at large time. And in fact, uh, if you, uh, it's easy to check that uh, if the, uh, the uh, oblique angle of the antenna is much bigger than this minimal angle theta c, then the coherence time is much more than L. So the typical situation would be when the gluon is emitted at large time, much bigger than the coherence. And so you can say, okay, since it's emitted at large time, then there is no color coherence, so the angle ordering can be violated. And this is wrong. Why it is wrong? Because that's correct that the emissions at large, emitted at large times are necessarily incoherent. That's correct. But what is incoherent is that this can be at large angle. If you if have a vacuum-like emission, with large angle, then the, 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 the fact that we impose the angle to be larger than the opening of the antenna, together with the fact that we impose this constraint on the formation time, you see the larger the angle, the shorter the formation time. So uh, having a vacuum-like emission with this constraint and at a large angle automatically implies that the formation time is more than coherent time. So the vacuum-like emission at large angle is, one, is like that or not like that. If it is like that, it cannot be emitted by the same argument as, as in the vacuum because during that time, it is still color coherent. So, in fact, the wide angle vacuum like emissions are still suppressed, like in the vacuum. So, this cascade has angular ordering, like in the vacuum. So, indeed, everything works like in the vacuum here on the, on the right hand side of this line. The only difference is that the cascade stops before the medium size in this discrete origin in phase space. But otherwise, it's like in the vacuum. Okay. So now I can generalize the argument. So far, I had only one emission. Now I can generalize that to an arbitrary cascade with, with successive emissions which are angular order. Because the angular order, just how it exists, angular order preserves the, the, the ordering lifetime. So having an angular order ensures that the lifetime of gluon 2 is much bigger than gluon 1, and the lifetime of gluon 3 is much bigger than the lifetime of gluon 2. So if the formation time of the length gluon in the cascade, say the number 3, obeys this constraint, if the last one obeys this constraint, the constraint is automatically obeyed also for the previous one, and so for the whole cascade. A whole vacuum like cascade has a formation time much bigger than the medium formation time. And then this develops exactly like in the vacuum. That vacuum is such a cascade. After the cascade, the vacuum like cascade is over, I have all these parts of one, two, three, which exist in the medium. Now they propagate happily to the medium. And once they do that, they can start filling the medium over a distance of order L because they get it very fast. But then they have the whole distance L in front of them. They will propagate over distance L. And in doing that propagation, now they will act as sources for medium dose radiation. They will suffer any loss themselves. And they will also radiate gluons inside the medium, which are medium induced, but also outside the medium. So there will be vacuum like emission by the medium vacuum because they will be outside of the medium from these sources. From these sources. So now let me focus on the on the first emission of the gluon 4 outside the medium. So once you see what the cascade gets inside the medium very fast, then these three gluons become sources, and one of them, the gluon 3, emitted the gluon 4 outside the medium. The distance between 3 and 4 is of the order of the medium size. So it's a, it's a large distance. Over that distance, this gluon has lost its color coherence with respect to gluon 2. All these sources have lost their color coherence. So when they emit outside, they're incoherent with each other. And because of that, now there is suddenly violation of angular ordering. There is no reason why the gluon 4 be emitted at a smaller angle as compared to this one, because there is no color point between this and this any longer. So the first emission outside the medium can occur at any angle. It can violate angular ordering. And that's very important, because you see, I can go, the, 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 the standard vacuum-like emissions inside the medium was, was compulsory leading me to smaller and smaller angles, was angular ordered. But now suddenly, I can reopen my phase space. I can emit from here to there. So I can radiate a, a soft gluon outside the minimum at large angle. And then from this point, more point on, I can start a new cascade towards smaller angles. So I have a huge enhancement of radiation at small energies and high angles and large angles because of this color decoherence for the very first cascading uh, emission outside the medium. But the color decoherence plays a role only for the first emission. There is no color decoherence during the cascade here. Of course, there is no color decoherence in the vacuum, but the very first emission had lost the property of, of color coherence, and it can go to any angle, and, it, 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 and in particular to a large angle. 
And that's, uh, that's um, materialized in the calculation uh, shown here. That was our original calculation, uh, which was done in a, in a double dynamic approximation so that we had analytic results before, we, before, before having the Monte Carlo. Uh, I'll notice that that's a, that's a double distribution of gluons in the phase space. No mechanics. So this is the Lund claim, and this is a distribution of gluons in energy and angle uh, as computed in the presence of the medium and divided by the genuine vacuum distribution, but the black one is a, is a black disk, sorry, is a vapor region. In the vapor region, there is no radiation in the, in, in the medium case, so this is uh, zero. Here, the ration is zero because T is zero, the vacuum is on zero, of course. But what, what, what it is yellowish or bluish, we have an excess in the medium as compared to the, to the, to the, to the vacuum. You see, we have an excess at, at more energies and large angles, besides because of this mechanism I mentioned to here. On the other hand, where, where it is uh, white, it is, the ratio is one, the white corresponds to one, uh, where it is reddish, the ratio is more than one, you know, we have a suppression. Why we have a suppression here? Because in order to radiate here, you can radiate from any sources, and in the, in the vacuum you have sources everywhere, but in the medium you have no sources in this excluded region, so you have less sources for radiation. Here we have, uh, you know, the, the Vito region naturally introduces uh, suppression here, and the lack of angular ordering for the first emission naturally introduces an enhancement there. And this is precisely due to the fragmentation function. It's obtained by integrating the double distribution over the angles. And you see that the rest of the fragmentation function in, in the medium and in the vacuum has an enhancement at small energy. This is this region here. And has a suppressor intermediate energy. This is this region there. Okay, sorry. the data actually right there was this overshoot at, at one actually yeah, in the fragmentation no, 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 no. you'll come to that okay course, good yeah. good so uh, let me tell you why 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 it's not there here so this is dla what is in dla it means that we neglect the the, the energy loss so we, 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 we there is no energy conservation we, we count the energy of the produced particles but we don't subtract it from the energy of the of the parent particles so each particle after emitting a gluon, the gluon is supposed to be soft, so the energy of the pile of particle remains the same. Of course, the DLA calculation ex overestimates the energy loss. Because uh, we have sources which are very energetic, they lose energy, but they, they, don't, they don't feel it, and they can radiate it again and again and again. And in reality, the energy is getting lost, uh, reducing the energy of the parent. So this picture is over um, optimistic. And of course, uh, at that level it was very suggestive, but there wasn't a proof. So to, to, to make that a proof, we, we went to Monte Carlo. Monte Carlo had energy conservation. And now I'm going to show you, I will, I will turn sooner to the fragmentation, but now I show you before the RAA. So these are the results, were not yet published, but uh, they're essentially uh, firm by now. Uh, so with, with Paul uh, and uh, Gregory, and especially Al Mura, which is the, with the main computer man in this, in this group, as you can imagine, uh, we've created the Monte Carlo, Monte Carlo program. That's the first paper by Al on Monte Carlo. So it, it's, a, it's a historical paper in that sense. It's a very historical paper. Um, so uh, since everything is Markovian, we can write Monte Carlo, we have, we, which includes everything now, both back in like a medium induced, uh, and, and all this constraint in the phase space. It's pretty straightforward. And here I show the prediction for Monte Carlo with red lines over imposed over the, the Atlas data for RAA. And we, see, we, we still have some increase at high PT, which is exceeding a bit of data, although it is consistent with the error marks, though. But um, without the black and white radiation, uh, uh, that would be uh, dramatically going like that. You know? In fact, uh, I, I, didn't show, I don't have results here, but we. To show that I, we have results where we, we, we know the energy loss, so we know the back my radiation, and then this ratio approaches to unity very fast. But here it remains uh, very small. So this is not a fit. We have just chosen values for the parameters we had and an alpha s by hand, by, and to such a way that we have a relatively good description in the lower part of the of, of, of the um, of the data. And and um, yes, and for instance, in this in this particular uh, plot here, we have valid the kinematical cuts. Uh, which are pretty, pretty arbitrary, what is the value of lambda QCD, and what's the maximum angle of the jet, and by varying this kinematical cut into the, uh, relatively large windows, from 0.15 to 0.5 for lambda QCD in jet, and from 0.75 to 1.5 for theta maximum, we see that our results are very robust. So in that sense, the, this cuts, these kinematical cuts don't change much in, in the result. Uh, and this plot here is, is, is obtained for different choices for Q hat and L in such a way that Q hat L squared b, b fixed. Uh, just to emphasize that, well, however you change Q hat and L, if you fix Q hat L squared, the, the result don't change. 
because that, that's the scale which controls energy loss. Well, more precisely, the scale which controls energy loss is alpha squared times two hectares squared, but alpha is also fixed, so uh, everything is fixed. So just to show that, in fact, uh, this, this kind of predictions are also very robust because they don't really care about the details of the medium. They only care about the, uh, the typical energy loss by, uh, by, by a jet gear medium in the radiation, which is alpha squared omega c. Right. If that's, a, that's a fixed number. You give that number, everything else just part and shower. You know, this has nothing to do with the model for the, for, the, for the medium. The only information about the medium is the value of omega c. Everything else is just because it's part of the And that's the fermentation function. Again, the, the, the black, points, uh, uh, um, black points are data from, uh, from Atlas and uh, the red curve for our, our descriptions. Again, the, the different red curve correspond to different choices for the, uh, for the uh, uh, in this case, for the um, cutoff from the theory. And there is some variability here because the fermentation function are more sensitive to the, to, to the, to the confinement scale because they will go to the relatively low moment here. Uh, but if you fix this, uh, this cut and you only buy, uh, buy if you have an L with fixed omega C, omega C or omega branch in the same, then you see that we have no, not that much variability. In fact, you describe the data very well with various values of Q hat and L such that that L squared is fixed. And uh, you, you see, in particular, not only the enhancement at small x and the expression at intermediate one, but you also see the enhancement at large x. That's not so. What, what happens uh, is that if you have energy conservation and if you have a beta region here, then the, the particles uh, with the living particle cannot emit here, right? So the probability to find the living particle in, in, in the presence of the medium is higher than to find it in the, in the vacuum, because in the vacuum, the living particle has also a property to emit here something. Because the fermentation function at z, sorry, at z close to one, you see the case here, see, this is uh, jet of order two, pt of the jet of order 200 GeV, and z is of order one here. The fermentation function near z equal one is just a probability to find the living particle inside the jet. And since in the medium there is, uh, there is less phase space for radiation, there is higher probability to find it there. But in order to be sensitive to this effect, we need energy conservation. So we have it. Okay, so uh, that's the end. The, the more detail about the Monte Carlo given by Paul next week. I invite you to listen to him. And thank you very much for your attention. And thank you very much for the organizer for everything, in particular for the discussion and in particular for the choice of the bus. Thank you. To, to make you an uh, advertisement for those who want to go this weekend, this is some of the marvelous places we have seen during, during this trip. And, uh, but the sunset, the sun rises from my room here this morning, and the sunset is from Nandi Hills, in, uh, so that uh, in the evening, in, so that Nandi Hills, everything else is the trip stuff uh, I have mentioned here, and this is the sunset from my room this morning. Thank you.